All right, hello. We're here at the Park Woods Town Hall um, with the uh, folks from the Charter Review Commission. Uh, we have uh, Melody Billings Young and Sophia Alvarez Castro, and we may be joined by Brian Lewis later. And just before we start, I wanted to try this new thing that I just read. Vicki Payne posted it about acknowledging tribal lands when we have a meeting. And I think that's a wonderful thing to do. I've discovered there are so many tribes from Portland that over 380, so I can't name them all, but let's just say we acknowledge all the tribes whose land we are occupying. So we're gonna begin the recording. Um, so let's start with uh, Sophia and Melanie telling us, first of all, let me just say this, uh, this commission has come to a unanimous decision uh, on our new governance system, and that is miraculous. You have to understand uh, in these days, a unanimous decision on anything is an achievement. So they've done it and uh, we're gonna be the beneficiaries of it. And that means it's gonna go directly to the ballot. Do not pass the council, right? It's gonna go right to the ballot and we're gonna vote on it in November. So they're gonna tell us what they landed on and, and what that means for us. So please take it away. Can I just say a word before we start, Terry, about this unanimity? Um, you know, this is an extraordinarily diverse council. We didn't know one another when we came in. We come from all different walks of life. We represent different ages, different races, different interests. We never physically met one another at all during the process. But what made the difference, and I think what, what spurred the unanimity was that we spent so much time listening to Portlanders. And I might've come in with certain ideas. Brian might've come in with certain ideas but we listened to what people kept telling us. And that pushed the needle until ultimately we were able to come with a complete agreement because ultimately it wasn't even so much our agreement as much as what Portlanders consistently told us they needed. That's excellent. Okay, so tell us what you agreed on. Okay, Sophia, ready to take it away? Yeah, one second. Of course, Zoom is being Zoom. <laughs> While we do it, Brian, are you here? I am, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for meeting with us tonight, folks. Oh, hey, Brian. Good evening. Welcome. So I think, Brian, are we gonna do what Sophia suggested? You're gonna do the first slide, I'll do the next three and you'll do the last one? Love it. Okay, great. And so jumping straight into uh, the presentation. On March 31st of this year, the Charter Commission reached a key milestone, preliminary agreeing on a package of reforms to advance to voters. All 20 commissioner, uh, commission members supported the package, which would recommend three major changes. First, allowing voters to rank candidates in order of preferencing using rank choice voting. Second, four new geographic districts with three members elected to represent each district, expanding the city council to a total of 12 members. Third, a city council that focuses on setting policy and a mayor elected citywide to run the city's day-to-day -day operations with the help of professional city administrators. Okay, so I'm going to take you through those three things in a little bit finer detail, uh, and then Brian's going to wrap it up. Let me start with ranked choice voting, which may seem like a funny place to start, but we've done a lot of polling by independent polling groups, and what we found is that of all the things we're proposing, the one that seems to be most popular with Portlanders is ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting is a system that allows you, and let me underscore the word allows, no one is forced, allows you to rank candidates in their order of preference. If you are uncomfortable with that, if you wanna vote for just one person, fine, nobody's forcing you. But if you can't, if it's difficult for you to say, well, I actually like all three of these people, then you're able to say, well, I like this person first, this person second, this person third. And what that means is if your first choice is knocked out, your second choice may still allow you to get someone that you like elected. And the chances that 
someone you like will be elected go from 50% to theoretically 75, but in reality, far closer to 90% chance that someone you have chosen will be elected to that position. So that's why we're going with ranked choice voting. And there's another reason, and that is because ranked choice voting goes hand in hand with multi-member districts. Can we go there, Sophia? So of all the things that the public asked us, and we've, we've gotten feedback from over 6,000 Portlanders, and they asked for two things primarily. One, we're gonna discuss on the next slide, which is a change in the form of government, and the other is district representation. Portlanders are feeling that, especially those out on the east side, that nobody knows what they're facing, that when they have problems, they don't know who to turn to, that, um, that the uh, representatives overwhelmingly represent the central city or the west side, all of which is true. Uh, we've never had a counselor from the far east side until Joanne Hardesty was elected. And that they want districts, they want council people who represent them. After a lot of work looking into this, we decided to go with four districts of three people each. Let me explain why we made that decision. First is that we knew that we wanted to expand the city council to about 12 or 13. When, the, when Portland agreed to a four person city council, that was back in uh, 2000, I think 2013, when we had 200,000 people. So it was about one per 50,000 people in the city. Well, now we have over 650,000 and it's still growing. We met with a lot of uh, experts who know about, um, who, who, who look a lot into voting and what makes populists happy. And they said the sweet spot is around 50,000. So if we looked at 50,000 people, again, that would be about 12 to 13 people for the size of Portland. But here's the problem if we went for individual districts. There are a few problems. One is, that Portland, unlike a lot of older cities like Boston, Chicago, or New York, we don't divide easily. We don't have like a Italian district and an Irish district and a black district and so forth. No, nor do we have rich districts and, and rental districts. If you look at virtually any makeup that you get in Portland, you will always get the same domination by white homeowners in any way you try and break it up as a single district. If we want to represent all the people in that district and not just the dominant 50%, we needed to turn to a multi-member form. But it's more important than just that. By having multi-member districts, the chances that you would elect a woman, just to give you an example, in Maryland, they have both single and multi-member districts. In their single member districts, 29% of the positions are held by women. In their multi-member districts, 45% of the positions are held by women. And this is also true, whether you make it about um, ethnic minorities, whether you make it about renters and so forth. If you wanna represent all of your people, you have to have more than one representative. And then there's the final reason that we like multi-member districts. And that is in terms of how you legislate. We're looking at a very robust, city council that would be a legislative and representative body. Right now, as you guys all know, Portland has a lot of challenges. That might be um, traffic, homelessness, um, crime, certainly, and many, many other things. If you want your district to be fully representative, fully represented, you can't rely on one person to manage all that. What we'll end up is something like we have now, which is we have maybe one commissioner with a staff of, of dozens who are doing all the work to tell the commissioner, well, here's what you need to know about this. We wanted something in which the commissioner has a direct relationship with the people and then has a direct relationship with the policy that is enacted. And so that is what we chose, four, person, uh, four districts, three people each, coming up with that sweet spot of 12 
And I will lastly say we chose four districts because Portland loves its quadrants. We love quadrants even when there are five or six of them. We will call them quadrants. So why not stay with what Portlanders are most comfortable with? Next slide, please. And so the final thing um, is actually the biggest thing that Portlanders demanded. And that was to end this commission form of government that we have right now that was enacted in 1913. And now we are the only city of any significant size that still has it. And what it means is that our city council, instead of representing the people and being primarily a legislative body, is spending its time being um, running the bureaus. And just I just did a, a little download of what we have here. And so just grabbing one commissioner at uh, random, we have um, Commissioner Rubio, who is running parks, uh, planning and sustainability, technology, elections, and she has liaison represent responsibilities for 10 different things, everything from Mount Hood Cable to regional arts and culture. So they're spending all of their time focused on these bureaus, and they don't really have the bandwidth any longer to focus on representing the people in neighborhoods like your own. So what we came up with, well, actually, let me step, step back a little bit. There are two very common forms in uh, city districts. One is called the mayor council form, and one is called the council manager form. In the mayor council form, you have a strong mayor with the council playing a legislative body. In the council manager form, you have the uh, council is the main body, and there's a chief administrative officer who is kind of running the day-to-day -day operations. And we went through so many meetings where we would ask Portlanders, there's this system and this system, which one do you like? And they would say, both. We like having a mayor that we can, an elected official that we can hold accountable. We like having a legislative body that represents us in our districts. And we like having a professional manager who can make sense out of this overlapping pretzel that we now have as a city government, who can cut back on overlap, who can cut back on, on uh, competition between bureaus and can allow them to work together to really tackle the problems we have today, be it homelessness, be it trash. In fact, in a meeting I went to earlier this week, I learned from someone that there are four different city bureaus right now doing polls to understand the trash problem in Portland. But none of the polls are cooperating with the others. They're all being paid for individually. They'll all be producing their individual results. What we have now is a city that can't work together. So we decided to create a hybrid version of that mayor council form where we would have an executive, chief executive mayor who would be elected at large. The one person who is overseeing the whole city as the mayor, he or she would propose the budget and would be responsible for carrying out policies. And as the mayor, he or she would name that city administrator or city manager, however you want to call it, but would not be the person who confirmed that because we want lots of checks and balances. So the mayor is looking at the big picture, carrying out the policy, and then we will have the city council, which will become primarily a legislative slash representative body, which develops the policy and represents the electorate and legislates on the policy. The city uh, council would also have the ability to amend and approve the budget that is presented by the mayor and most importantly, in terms of that mayor chief administrative officer um, relationship would confirm the city administrator, kind of like we have in our national system. So the mayor couldn't just pick somebody. The mayor would have to choose someone that was professional enough that that person would be confirmed by the city council. And finally, we would have the chief administrative officer or city administrator who would manage those day-to-day -day operations, appoint and oversee bureau directors, but would report 
to the mayor. So uh, if the mayor what felt that that administrator was not doing a good job, the mayor would have it within his or her portfolio to fire that person. But the city council could also, by a supermajority of three quarters, do that as well. Some people have asked me, well, if the, if, if the administrative officer is running the city, what is the mayor doing? Well, the administrative officer is running the city in terms of the day-to-day -day management. That should not be what the mayor is doing. The mayor is looking at policy and making sure that that day-to-day -day management is, is following the policy that the mayor and the city council has developed. And people say to me, what will the city council be doing? Well, they will be representing people. They'll be sitting on committees to address our long-term problems and they will be legislating. And won't this be tremendously more expensive, people ask me, to go from four to 12? Well, one wonderful thing is that by taking away the uh, commission job that they have now and having them work together within districts, you can cut way down on the, um, the number of, of uh, assistants that they have. Because right now, for example, um, I just looked up, Dan Ryan has, has nine main advisors and then hundreds of them underneath that. A lot of that can be made much less cumbersome. Next slide, please. Brian, off to you. Thank you, madam. <clears throat> so here's our phase one timeline from now through the ballot referral in late June. The city attorney's office is currently drafting uh, charter amendment language. And once that commission uh, receives uh, the drafted language, the commission will host a series of public hearings in May for Portlanders to provide input. The final amendment package will be uh, voted on in June before critical referral to the November ballot. And so, the, the stage that we're in right now could be misleading, right? We're getting back legal language uh, to help us better understand this initial set of recommendations. But part of the reason why we're reaching out to folks like yourselves is because we're not done. We still want your and the public's involvement in this process because this is important. We're, we're, we're trying to refine this thing and imbue it with the wisdom and the innovation of all the people in this city. This is your process. You are integral to it. And so I'm really, really excited to start uh, looking at some of your questions and, uh, and seeing what your thoughts are about this. Hey, was that the, is that the where we are part? That's where we are, sir. That's where we are. Um, well, then we have submitted some questions. We're gonna go through that and then I'll open it up when we're done with this, we'll open it up and see if anyone else has any other questions, okay? Sure. All right. Uh, so I think I might've seen uh, uh, from your graphic, but what district does Park Roseland in? We do not, will not be designing the districts. We are creating a commission that will be drawing those districts, but we will be putting some, um, some rules on what they can do. And so one is that they have to hold neighborhoods together. They have to be contiguous districts. Mm -hmm. um, neighborhoods themselves would not be broken up. Um, right now we've looked at, at various plans and I can't tell you what the outcome will be, but it basically looks like four blocks at this point. Right. So you've got the far east is gonna be one, northeast, uh, southeast, another, and then the west side, kind of a right. third, fourth. Okay. But, but I, 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 I understand that the guideline is that all the districts have to be relatively equal in population. Okay, all right, so that's good. So we'll, when might we be able to actually see a district map? That probably wouldn't be done until after the election because it part of part of what you'd be voting for is for them to draw the district map. Okay. Um, 
So uh, as far as electing uh, three reps per district, how do you see the mechanics of that going? Is it, I suppose it's just like anything else, right? I mean, you just, uh, we'll have an election time and we'll get our ballots. So let's say we're district three, let's just say that, right? We'll get our ballots in district three and we'll have our uh, potential reps on there and we'll just vote for three, is that correct? Uh, more or less, Brian, did you wanna take this or shall I go? Uh, feel free. Okay, so the way it's going to be, it will be staggered like it is currently, but it won't be staggered within your district. So for example, districts one and three would vote in one year, districts two and four okay. would vote in another. You would vote, you would vote for who you like in order of rank, and then the top three vote getters would become the three representatives from that district. You also asked how it would work. I'm hoping that one thing that will happen in terms of how it will function uh, afterwards, we are now looking at, in fact, I think it will be in the, in the charter language, that the three people would not have offices in city hall, but rather would share an office within the district. Um, and that there would be certainly a division of responsibilities in the same way that we do have now, like in the US Congress, in which you serve on different committees. And so you might have one person focusing in one area and one person in another. That's great. I'm glad to hear that it's the ranked voting would be for the, the top three would be I was afraid it might be ranked voting for each of the three. So now we have, you know, <laughs> dozens of people we're looking at, you know. And it doesn't work that way. When, yeah, when it, you do it that way, then the dominant group just keeps winning. Right, okay, well, I, I like that, that's great. And I like the fact that they would be officed in the district. That makes a big difference, right? Um, so just on that note, you know, how do we avoid, I know you probably you can't answer in a, in a sentence, but how do we avoid everybody running to their favorite parent? You know what I mean? How do we avoid that as a, as a, as a district, as a community? Well, I, mean? I don't think you can completely avoid it, but yeah. I will say that if it works as I am foreseeing that it will, you are going to have someone mm -hmm. who's sitting on a homelessness committee and one who is sitting mm -hmm. on a traffic committee. So when you have there a traffic go. issue, that's the person you're going to run to. Okay. Yeah. Cause I mean, I'd hate to have a, you know, you have a situation that's a little controversial and each of the three have a different position on it and all of a sudden we're all split. And so, you know, then we have no voice really, right? There's no collective voice from our district. One really neat thing about multi-member districts is it's been shown to increase collaboration. In fact, I just want to point one other thing out that is a little unusual, but the 12, the number 12 is a little unusual because it, there's no um, and we're not giving a tie-breaking authority to the mayor. And one reason that we decided against doing that is we've been looking around the nation and there's too much going on. Look at in our federal government, everything is coming down to that 50-50 with the vice president coming in and making the difference and the country remains as split as it is. But by making it 12, in order to win, you have to get seven votes, seven to five. So now it's forcing collaboration. I like it, make them work it out, right? And that's kind of my feeling about, you know, like, like our group and we've got the uh, Parkwoods Neighborhood Association and other groups that are, you know, all trying to do good work in the community. And I think it's gonna uh, fall to us to be more collaborative, you know what I mean? To all get I together agree. and say, hey, you know, let's, let's, let's us agree on this before we take it to our reps so we're not giving them a, you know, a pile of confusion, you know, like here's how we all think about it, right? So we'll, we're gonna work on that. Um, Let's see. Okay, so so now our, when our three reps go to the council table, so you know you have these four districts, three reps. When they are at the council table, our three reps, are they, you know, is it one voice or are they, as you say, you know, they're each on different committees, and so they're, you know, I just wonder how how they how they present at the council table from from our district, you know, as one unit. Brian, I, I feel like I've been doing all the talking here. Do you want to take this question? I can certainly try, um, but I think you've been doing a bang up job. Thank you, Melanie. Um, <clears throat> so the truth is, is that w we, there's an urge to be quite prescriptive and we have worked mightily to not do that, right? To empower this new government and the community um, in any number of ways, but to allow for it to develop 
naturally as well, to give them the room to spread their wings, if you will. And so while there's the possibility that, um, that different representatives <laughs> will be politicians and um, follow through on their own interests, we're trying as hard as possible to establish the right incentives so that people are as collaborative as possible, not just within their own district, but across districts, right? By having a, a various forms of commissions focusing on various issues and with the possibility of uh, public budgeting and, and other ways for non-elected officials, uh, the citizenry to be involved, we're incentivizing um, people to come together and champion the issues of renters, of young people, of seniors and working class folks, right? Um, so the, 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 ans the answer is, to be frank, sir, um, we're hoping that people show up and are representing your district and your interests, but we're, we're, we're balancing that with the reality of the fact that these people are people and politicians. So understandable. I mean, uh, a lot of this is, you know, we're going to have to work this out, right? We're going to have to shake this out as we go. And, you know, nobody's holding you responsible for all the answers, but we have to ask the questions. But, you know, one neat thing, Terry, is right now, it's really hard to hold anyone ac accountable because they're all running at large. Mm -hmm. So you may be unhappy with someone's vote, but there's not much you can do about it. Right. Once we're in this district forum, if you have, for example, one member of your district, we'll call that person Melanie, who is not <laughs> who is not cooperating with the other two, you can vote that person out. See, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, you know, we ultimately, the citizens do have the voice, right? Ultimately. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Um, so uh, these next few questions, I think we could blend together. Um, now that we, we have this agreement, it's wonderful. Um, and, 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 you, and, you, and you're showing how you're doing it now. The question is, how are you gonna sell this to the citizenry? I mean, you sold it to us, we're on board but there's a lot more people, right, than these groups you're talking to. How are you gonna sell it to the citizenry and do you see any roadblocks there? Have you noticed any, you know, any, any knots that you've got to start chipping away at? Okay, I am so ready for this question. <laughs> right. Bring so, it. Bring um, it. I, we've done a couple of polls. They've been by independent organizations out of Washington, DC. So no dog in the fight for these groups. Uh, in early May, March, uh, one, both of them looked at about 600 voters. And what they found was, and this is so interesting, these were just people likely to vote. 72% um, support ranked choice voting versus only 11% who strongly oppose. And I choose strongly oppose because if they kind of oppose, that means they can be turned. If it's strongly opposed, we assume that they're against it. But we're looking at 11%. 58% support multi-member districts. 53% support increasing the city council to 12, but only 20% strongly oppose. 70% support a city manager and only 7% strongly oppose. But here's the really interesting thing. There's been some stuff in the paper and so forth that says what you're putting together is too complicated. If you make it complicated, people won't understand it. If they don't understand it, they'll vote no we found the exact opposite. They don't see it as complexity. They see it, I think it's fair to say, they see it as um, protection. So when FM3 Research did its poll, they asked how many people like the mayor council form? 51%. They said, what if we combine mayor council with ranked choice voting? It went up to 56%. What if we combine mayor council with ranked choice voting and bigger district-based council. It goes up to 59%. People want the whole package. And what they're seeing is, they're not looking at it like, um, I'll pick this one and this one and this one. What they're saying is we are so unhappy with what we have right now. We want a full system that's gonna replace that. Yeah. So we have talked to thousands of people. Not one person has said the city is on the right direction. No. In fact, 80% polled said it's not working. But more than that, we have received support from Portland Business Alliance, from labor unions, 
from coalition of communities of color, from renters, from homeowners. We are not at this point, I think we will get it, but at this point, we are not seeing any strong opposition. I think the biggest concern is probably gonna be financial because uh, Portlanders are feeling really strapped right now for money and they're worried if we raise the council to 12, what that will mean, but we're doing our homework right now. And I actually believe in the savings we can do from not doubling over and having such an inefficient bureau system, mm -hmm. we can actually make up for that. And it's not going to be particularly more expensive. Yeah. Uh, personally, I would say that uh, we can't even really spend too much to get a, a government that works. I mean, money should not even be the, the issue from my perspective, because right now, the amount of money that's being wasted with our system right now, people don't even understand. So that's right. You know, I think I think uh, that message should be out there that, look, I mean, you know, th this is this is going to be a bargain at twice the price because we're going to have control. And then we can really watch. We'll have more transparency because we can ask people, hey, you know, we, we approved that bond, you know, for four million dollars. Show us how you spent that. You know what I mean? We can't even ask that now. So exactly. I don't I, I really don't think money should be an issue at all. That's just my personal thing. No, but right. speaking of speaking and, of. Um, I'm sorry. And then I, I appreciate the question. Um, I mean, part of what we've been, we put so much work into doing is cultivating a, a real and meaningful public engagement process so that by the time that we're actually done with all of this research, talking to all these different experts and academics and whatnot, we're, we're not coming to people after the facts, mm -hmm. right? You're a part of the process. You've heard from us along the way. We're getting your input at every stage so that you understand what's happening, so that you're, you can actually put your two cents in. Um, and what I really mean by that is cultivating trust. And that's one of the most, and that's one of the things that's been lacking in our politic locally for so very long. Um, as we started to do our outreach, one of the things that we kept getting hit over the head time and time again is there's a lack of trust. There's a lack of outreach. People don't understand the processes. They don't have any real connection or engagement with the people that are supposed to be representing them. And I have a lot of affection for these elected officials. I know some of them personally, and, and I, I appreciate how hard their job is. The, 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 how tall their task is, I sympathize. But we're trying to create a new government that actually empowers and emboldens and ennobles people. Um, and we can only do that with real connection and real trust. And that's what we're trying to do here in that with you. Well, I think you guys did a bang up job there because you, I mean, you get a lot of trust uh, from our community, I'll tell you right now. I and mean, it's because you're doing this. Uh, so that's a good thing. Um, just, just quickly on the ranked choice, will the ranked choice vote and the governance vote be decoupled on the ballot or are they one? We can't determine that. I'm hoping, we're hoping that it will be one for, that, for those poll reasons that I told you. Um, but there are all kinds of rules on precisely how you can write vote uh, uh, measures. So we don't know the answer to that, but we're hoping it will be one. Yeah, listen, you guys are doing the work. I mean, I, my, my opinion is that they should be decoupled only because uh, you could have people that really love the governance idea, <clears throat> but I may be confused about rank and they're just like, ah, you know, you know, why I, I not think, just- You know, know, you're making a good point, Terry, except that the polling showed it to be the opposite. So we, we have been paying attention to that. Frankly, maybe the answer is that both would work, but it's almost like, um, it's almost like by having it decoupled, it makes it more complex for people, but we'll see because it's out of our hands at this point. I get you. My only thought is if, if the polling says every, most people like everything, then there's no fear in decoupling, right? Because they're going to vote for both. If they That's like true. It. You know, the, but for those people that maybe are just like, man, I just don't understand that, you know, because people, we, we all, we our understanding of voting, I, I love the ranked choicing, but, but most people's understanding of voting is, hey, there's, a, there's someone on the ballot, we vote for them. That's it, right? 
So I just hate to have people be confused about rank choice and then not vote for the governance, right? You're but right, that, but we you. will do a lot of a lot of education to point out yeah. you don't I have you to will. rank. You don't have. You can just pick one. Yeah, I know. I know you will. You're doing it. You know, it was just my thought. I wanted to share it. You know. Thank you. Um, yeah, and for some of the organizations that would be trying to help us lift this load when it comes to actual election time, um, they they have fears that if these different elements were decoupled, then that incentivizes some supporting groups to lean towards the things that they most agree with and not put the effort into, into other elements. Um, the campaign is gonna be hard enough. Um, yeah. And so keeping it simple, yeah. <laughs> keeping unified, that's, that's one of our big goals. Sure. Well, listen, you know, you guys have taken it this far. I'm just going to trust, you know, you know, you're, you're doing a great job. Um, the last question I have is, you know, um, we understood from recent reporting that uh, that the mayor, even though this is not going to, let's say we vote for it all, it's not going to kick into 2024, but actually the mayor right now could hire a city manager under That's current correct. structure. That is correct. And uh, he's not about to do it. Um, but I think that what could happen is if this whole package were approved, the part about the rank choice voting in the multi-member districts could not, that could not go into place until 2024. That's right. But the city administrator could because the mayor has it within his power to remove the bureau assignments from everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll just have to see what happens. I'd love to see a campaign of pressure for that because wouldn't it be great if the city manager had a year head start, right? Yes. You know what I mean? So 23, he's up and running. He's got his people in place and then this thing kicks in and boom, we're running, right? Yes. That would be, that would be cool. Um, so if you need help with pressure I think we need you out there, Terry. You need to be out there leading this campaign. If you need some help in a pressure campaign, I am volunteering right now. Thank Is you. that right? I, you, I, you're on tape, so don't try and wiggle out. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, no, because I think I think that the, the fact that we can do that, I think it's crazy if we don't, because that would just lay the groundwork for a smooth transition, you know, rather than everyone showing up January of 2024 saying, hey, where's the bathroom? You know, I yeah. mean, that would just be a great thing to do. Um, so anyway, that was wonderful. That's the end of um, our questions. And I would like to open it up to see if anyone else that's here with us. Um, Claudia has a question. Okay, let me, I gotta figure out what I'm doing here. Ask. Hi, Claudia. Oh, Claudia, you muted yourself. <laughs> there you go, no. Well, hang on. Claudia asked you one. Why am I, why is that not happening? Okay, I'm, hit, I'm hitting ask to unmute. There yep, she there is. You there go. I am. Am I am? You are. Um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, have you um, determined how long the terms are going to be? If they're going to be staggered? They'll be four year terms. Four year staggered. terms. And I know there's no guarantees, but th the thought that the same people that run now, how are we going to? We're going to hope that we don't get uh, old white guy homeowners, three of them in a district. I think that would be pretty difficult to do. Um, you might get one, right? <laughs> but, yeah. But I, you know, there's a couple things. You know, you when you said um, I thought you were going to go in the direction of, you know, will we still be unhappy with whoever we elected? I guess that's the nature of election. But the, the fact that you will know who represents your district, you're going to be hold, able to hold them a lot more accountable at the ballot box. They're going to have to behave toward your district much more clearly and better. But what we have seen is that when it moves to a multi-member district, the diversity goes up exponentially. And um, I gave the, those numbers a little bit earlier about, you know, the number of women that was elected went up by 50% in Maryland in a multi-member district. And the same is true 
there have been, I think I, I have something here. Just give me a minute because this was really interesting. I think right here, yes. So in Illinois, back in 1980, Illinois cut back from multi-member to single member districts. And they did it because the people proponents said it would be less expensive and more competitive and more diverse. What actually happened 10 years after they did a study, 10 years afterwards, expenses and staffs more than doubled. 99% um, of the incumbents won re-election and that the, um, there was less diversity, increased partisanship. So what that shows if we flip it around to the other way is that when you move to a multi-member district, it really allows different voices to be heard. Okay, can I ask another question about um, if, if the world flips back to, to in-person meetings, if um, the representatives have their offices in the district, will they also have an office space in city hall and they will have a, city council meetings while they're all, where they're all there? I just looked at the way uh, today they sent us the um, proposed changes that this would mean to the city charter. Proposed, not final. But one of the questions that came up was this issue. And normally in other uh, cities that have this similar situation, they will have their office in the district and then in the city hall, there'd be kind of a joint shared office that they could use when they come in to have votes and things like that. But their primary office would be in the district. Okay. Um, and my request is, could you put the slide up with the, the uh, timeline? Again, I was writing down when the, the outreach would begin and stuff and I didn't get done before you were, um, before you took it down. And is there somewhere that you can sign up to be notified when the public, um, your, what, let's see, so meeting you, with the public like on the- slide Also, because there's the, the outreach slide that we didn't show in this presentation. Yeah. Thank you. And so Claudia, this is gonna be recorded. This is gonna be recorded. I'm gonna post it on next door tomorrow. So you'll have this whole recording. Yeah, okay. and I can send a copy of the slides as well for folks. Um, I'll send that to you, Terry. Okay. Um, One second. If, if I may, um, regarding your, your initial question, Madam, part of what motivated us to create this package as it stands is that we wanted to ensure um, as much as reasonably possible, that we do get a more representative city council that actually reflects yeah. the intentions, <clears throat> wishes, um, the life experience of the city. And so we work very, very hard to cobble together something that would actually make it less expensive, logistically easier um, to actually run and to win, right? Which gives people that traditionally don't run because they're not as well connected, because they don't have um, all the fancy titles or went to the right schools, uh, because they didn't inherit a lot of money or or what have you, all the different barriers, we're trying to lower them and give opportunities to young people, to seniors, to working class people, to represent people like themselves and champion the things that the district actually cares about. And yeah, so, absolutely. yeah, and so, I mean, to, again, to your, your earlier point, um yeah there, there will be some male white richer homeowners that will, will they will run and win some of my favorite people <laughs> fall into that category yes. right um 
but they're they're an important part of this city too. My my intention is to create more space at the table for more folks that look like us and can bring more to the table, more of the conversation. And I think that with this this package and the process that we're developing, we can actually do that. Well said, Brian. Sophia, can you just show the next slide? If you have it there, there you go. I will say that we just put on our website all the information for our May public hearings that we're gonna have. We're having four, a total of four public hearings. Um, two of them will be virtual and then two of them will be in, port, um, in person um, and one will be in East Portland. Uh, we're looking at securing a location right now, um, but all that information is available on our website. So Sophia, if folks go to charter review at portlandoregon.gov, They'll get all these links. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's so Claudia. That's the one place you go. You'll get okay. all the information. Okay, thanks. And I just put them in the chat too. The direct link to sign up for email updates and the direct link for our May public hearings. I'm trying to do that now. Dee Dee, so if you just go to Google and say Portland Charter Commission, bam, it'll come up. So okay. do it easy. Okay, thank you. And so, so watch out because Portland, Maine is also doing a charter review. <laughs> Be careful. Oh, oh no. <laughs> but you know, um, I, I love the opportunity to, to sit in on these conversations with folks and, and meet new people. I, I take this really seriously. And I take you and your concerns really seriously. I know that uh, it's almost seven, but I want I want to make sure that people feel like they can they can ask the question or put something out there that maybe we haven't talked about. There's, there are no bad ideas here. Appreciate that. Uh, is there anybody else who's on our group here that has a question they'd like to put out? Or even just a statement. Or a statement. Yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to show. Can we get back to uh, seeing everybody's faces? Here we are. Thank you. Um, so I would say, if no one's popping up with a question, it is almost seven. And you know, I think we could, uh, I think we've got a lot of great information. I feel like this was a really wonderful conversation. Um, and again, I wanna really congratulate you and please bring this back to your team, the whole crew that, uh, you know, that Park Rose appreciates what you're doing. You know? Thank you, yeah. Terry. I enjoyed yeah. meeting all of you and Claudia, I have an old Asian man in the kitchen who's just waiting for dinner. So I think I should sit there. <laughs> better I get in there. That. That's why Thanks I'm thinking we'll that. just cut out five minutes early. Nobody gets upset, everyone gets fed. Okay? Well, here's a good question. Um, Dee Dee, how can you help? Well, I'll tell you, one of the best ways is if you have other connections, we'll come and talk to what, what your church group, your school group, your whatever, talk to people. Tell them to vote. We, we want to get the word out there. That's really, really important. The thing that's going to that most likely to make us lose is people who choose not to vote. Right. Well, there won't be anyone in our district, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> we won't allow it. Um, okay, listen, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brian and Melanie and Sophia. And please thank the rest of the, the commission. Um, and we'll, we'll just keep watching and, and, and listening. And, uh, you know, if we can do anything to help, uh, we will. You can. So I hope to see you guys again. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. Thank you all Bye -bye, for everybody. all the work you've done. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.